let me introduce our, our first speaker on this, and that's Tim Hunt, the CEO of the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine in Europe. And you're going to give us the overview of where we are with the state of the ATMP sector in Europe. And that gives us the context. It's perhaps a new area, a new therapy area for Europe, and we need to understand where we are. So Tim, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, everyone. I'm going to give us a second while we uh, load up our slides. I've got uh, about 15 minutes in which I can uh, say a few things. But first, it's a great pleasure to be here. So uh, I want to thank our our hosts. Um, it's it's terrific to be here to talk about the state of the ATMP sector in Europe. Uh, we're getting close. One more sec. Okay, if we could go to, yep, next slide, please. There we go, thanks. So, um, you know, maybe a minute first on, you know, who who is the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine? We're the global voice of the cell and gene therapy sector, right? We represent about a little, little under 500 uh, members in total. That's primarily a, a combination of uh, small and medium-sized biotechnology companies to larger biotechnology companies, medical and um, research centers, prominent academic research centers, tool and service providers that are often the backbone of our organization, things like uh, uh, CDMOs, right, outsourced uh, contract manufacturing organizations and clinical trial organizations, and patient organizations, oftentimes uh, representing patients with very rare dis disorders. Um, we think of ourselves as the leading international advocate for ATMPs, and that includes we convene the sector and facilitate influential exchanges. We uh, shape the field through data and analytics and analysis, and we work with key stakeholders to enable the development of advanced therapies to modernize healthcare systems, and I'll spend some time talking about that today. And again, we represent a little, little under 500 members total, about 85 are here in Europe. Next slide, please. So when we talk about, you know, ATMPs, just by way of quick reminder, what, what are the technologies we're talking about? So it's things like gene therapies that introduce a functioning gene into a patient's cell, sometimes also called gene augmentation. Gene editing, a world I used to work in, that includes things that are so somewhat well-known, like many people have heard of CRISPR gene editing, which has become popular in the, in the media, uh, oftentimes called a molecular scissors, right? But it goes back in time to things like talons and zinc fingers that have been around for about 20 years. Um, and then more recently today, things like base editing and prime editing. So many, many n very new advances that have the ability to insert, replace, remove, or modify DNA, a very promising area for us. Um, cell therapy, right, that's sometimes also called, um, uh, it's often thought of as, you know, transferring cells into a patient to treat a disease or somatic therapy. Um, and then areas like tissue engineered therapy that can help replace damaged tissue with natural or synthetic tissues. Next slide, please. And so, you know, we've had a terrific 2022, which is great news for our patients. So there's been a lot of new approvals. And if you look at this slide, the pink area to the left um, is really new therapies that have been approved uh, thus far in the year. So we've got important therapeutics like Legend uh, Biotech and, and Janssen's CAR-T therapy, in Europe, Roctavian was approved earlier this summer for hemophilia, a major advance for patients. And then other gene therapies um, by PTC Therapeutics, Unicure and CSL Bearing. So a very good year for brand new approvals uh, in the US and Europe. And then the blue um, side of the screen represents therapies approved in new geographies or for new indications, and I won't go through them all, but um, again, a lot of impressive advancements of science in service of patients. Next slide, please. But the good news is not yet done uh, for this year, and if this slide represents 
anticipated regulatory decisions uh, for the remainder of the year and for 2023, which is really terrific. So in orange, we see European approvals that are expected. And in the kind of purplish, reddish color, uh, we see um, approvals expected for the United States. And so, for example, before the end of the year, we believe we will see an approval for tab cell from Atara Biotherapeutics, which is which is an incredibly important advancement. Um, it's an allogeneic um, cell therapy, the first that would be approved, which is a tremendous technological breakthrough, right? So it's an off-the-shelf cell therapy, and that is going to be approved in all with all expectations here in Europe, which is also a real testament to the process of working with the EMA in Europe. I've spoken to the CEO of Atera, and he's been highly complimentary of the EMA and really leaning into the advanced science of this important technology. It's a small indication from a patient perspective. It's an orphan disease, but it is a major breakthrough in the, in this, in the scope of our science. So we're really looking forward to that being approved in Europe by the end of the year. And then in 2023, there are a lot of therapies, as you can see, that are anticipated to be approved. And they range from important breakthroughs in sickle cell disease and hemophilia to cancer and other rare disorders. So a lot of hope and a lot of promise for our patients. And, you know, just to get more specific into Europe, Europe has a proud, rich, and important history of leading on behalf of patients, right? Um, we have, you know, in Europe, outstanding universities very talented hospitals and prominent academic centers and an outstanding workforce, right? Um, the EMA is regarded as really a gold standard globally. Um, I don't think we can almost praise the EMA enough for their ability to really lean in and go deep on the science and really understand this technology. I participated in a, in a forum back and I think it was 2017 with the EMA um, on gene editing, and they were really trying to go deep and understand the science. Um, so I think they're to be complimented. And uh, Europe uh, came up with the first visionary classification for our technologies, right? Today we call them ATMPs. That was back in 2007. Um, Europe also approved, they, uh, they not only came up with the classification, they then approved the first ATMP many years ago, and then later the first gene therapy right, well ahead of the United States and still often is at the leading edge of regulatory approvals. Um, there are improvements in clinical trial regulations and there are examples of uh, payment model successes that are very important. And there are a lot of ambitions around creating, you know, health data uh, advances that we think will be very, very meaningful. And, you know, the late stage clinical trial uh, pipeline in Europe is very impressive with about 60 uh, products in late stage trials out of 200 worldwide. Next slide, please. You know, why is this so important? I think if there's only one thing that you would take away from my remarks today, it's this one slide. Like, why is this so important? Um, the truth is, for millions of our patients around the world, the status quo represents death or serious disability, right? Millions of patients around the world. Um, our science is advancing rapidly. That's great. But our healthcare systems all over the globe, the US, Europe, regulators, payers, right? The healthcare system simply must advance and modernize to catch up with our science. These are not, you know, the small molecule pills of the 1970s and 80s or the early biologics back, you know, a million years ago when I joined the biotech industry in the 1990s or the 2000s. These are vastly improved therapeutics that have the potential to provide durable benefits for our patients. And in some cases, we believe they may be curative. And that is a revolutionary concept. As someone that's been in biotechnology for almost 25 years, that is a, a profound change 
Therefore, we don't think the status quo should be applied to them, right? We'll talk more about that um, in a moment. Next slide, please. So a lot of need, a lot of important advances. Europe has certainly been a leader, but there are some serious concerns that Europe is falling behind on competitiveness in this area and that increasingly patient access is unfortunately at risk. So I mentioned ATMPs were a classification first developed in Europe back in 2007. There have been 23 ATMPs approved in Europe over the last intervening years. Unfortunately, seven out of the 23 have been withdrawn from the market, primarily around commercial concerns, right? Can they fundamentally, are, are payers in Europe really valuing this technology for, the, for what it provides, not only for the patients, but for what we think it provides to healthcare systems as well? And, and so there's some real concerns there. We did a survey in the spring um, where we, we, we polled um, our members, and of the respondents, 57% expressed concerns about Europe's ability to compete globally, um, and 40% were extremely or very concerned that European patients won't have access to ATMPs in the future, and that is a concern, I think, and it should be for all of us. Next slide. There we go. Thank you. Um, so, you know, there's other data out there that suggests we're falling behind, right? So this concerns, you know, trends in investment, companies, and clinical trials. And so this, this snapshot looks at comparing 2017 to 2022, so five years of change, right? And if you look at the first bucket of investments, you see in North America, you know, about $2 billion more um, invested in ATMPs over this period of time, this five-year five -year period of time. That's about 60% growth. In Europe, you see a 47% decline, right? Company formation, which is critical for building, really building out an enduring market that serves patients, right? 42% growth in North America. Asia Pacific region, 270% growth in Europe, flat, slightly up, right? For clinical trials in the industry, you see 41% growth in North America, almost 75% growth in Asia Pacific, and, you know, flat, slight growth in Europe. Next slide, please. This shows, you know, some concerning trends in, um, in clinical trials, right? Impacting patients today and possibly in the future. It's a somewhat busy slide, but the, the kind of headlines are in Asia Pacific, you know, you see growth from call it 400 and change up to almost 1400 clinical trials today. You know, North America starting from a similar position today, a little over 1200 clinical trials. And in Europe, you see growing from, you know, somewhere around 200 to about 500 and 56, you know, growth, certainly, but, may, but not as robust as in other areas. Next slide, please. This is then a breakout of clinical trials. And if you start over on the far right, I think this tells an interesting story, right? So I mentioned earlier, there's 60 uh, clinical trials going on in Europe, which is terrific news. We're seeing that, right, with these approvals that took place this year, next year, and the intervening years. That's great. Uh, basically on par, pretty close to being on par with Asia Pacific and North America in phase three trials. You go all the way over to the far left, it paints a very different story, right? Where you see a very low number of clinical trials in phase one with only two new uh, uh, trials that have come forward uh, year over year versus about 20 to 30 in North America and the Asia Pacific region. So, and in between you see sort of the step down um, from that. So I think that that paints a challenging portrait of the future because that will then pull through to phase two trials and phase three trials. So that's a, that's a warning sign that I think we should all uh, be sensitive to. Next slide, please. Well, what are some of the issues that may be driving some of these things either uh, to date or going forward? 
um, that we should all be attuned to. Um, and I, I would call this, you know, overall, I would say these represent a yellow warning light that is flashing. It's a cautionary tale for us all, I think, which is, you know, in, you know, there are times, as I mentioned earlier, when, when as a philosophy, our, our technologies are viewed very similar to, you know, the pills of the 1970s and 1980s and those early, early biologics from 20 or 20, uh, 20 or 30 years ago. 20 or 30 years ago, right? So applying the same policies uh, to ATMPs is just not fit for purpose. Um, there are select areas that are concerning to us, like the hospital exemption, right? Which is, you know, permitting a pathway for large scale commercial manufacturing of experimental drugs that could result in an uneven two tiered regulatory approach. That's our concern, right? The initial notion of the hospital exemption I think was not only important, but noble, but it was very focused on patients with high met need where there is not an approved ATMP. And there, there's some concerns that in the future, this is going to deviate to a larger scale commercial manufacturing approach of experimental um, drugs. Complex regulation and lack of harmonization you know, the, the requiring GMO reviews for ATMP clinical trials when these were really built around agricultural products and having to do this across 27 different markets doesn't seem to make sense in 2022. That's an area we think we could rationalize quite a bit more. Um, and then generally a lack of value recognition I touched on earlier. You know, m many member states, most um, are using health technology assessment frameworks designed for traditional pharmaceuticals versus embracing things like um, real world evidence, right? And so we, see, we're, we have some concerns that we might see, you know, the European Union's health technology um, regulation, you know, embrace things like randomized clinical trials against active comparators, which again is more fit for the past than for the future. Next slide, please. And so, the good news is there's a little bit of a, we're a little bit of a fork in the road and we can choose a better path. And so that's part of what we're really urging today to choose the better path and to put patients at the center of some of these very important policies that will fuel greater uh, competitiveness in Europe, fuel more clinical trials. And I would argue down the road, really enable greater access for patients again, for whom too often the status quo represents death or serious disability. So one tremendous opportunity is a once in a generation review and revision and update of the pharmaceutical legislation, right? Where, where there's an opportunity to embrace, you know, this kind of modern approach and, and be more forward looking about the uniqueness of ATMPs to exempt ATMPs specifically from GMO uh, legislation that was built originally around agriculture products to get the balance right with hospital exemption and go back to that important and noble purpose that, that began, right? And then to look at things like the EU's health technology assessment framework, right? To identify sources of uncertainty and address beyond randomized clinical trials, right? To take a more modern approach to that to provide clear EU-wide guidelines for the use and embrace, as I mentioned a moment ago, of real world um, evidence, which will also enable, we think, the use of innovative payment models for member states. And then the uh, you know, continued collaboration with developers through, throughout the joint clinical assessment process. So there is a little bit of a fork in the road and we're here cheering on, I would say for a better path. Next slide. You know, and to do that, it's important to keep at all times the patient at the center of why we're all here and the, the big mission that we all are working towards, right? Which is to help us deliver the future of medicine for patients like Emily, right? Who we're very blessed to have here and her father, Tom, who will speak in a moment. Um, you know, as I mentioned, our science is advancing rapidly and whether it's in the United States or in Europe, or other parts of the globe, we, our view is our health systems have to modernize and really need to catch up with our advanced science. Next slide. 
So in summary, Europe has led before and possesses all the right positive ingredients to innovate for patients again, but we're at this fork in the road, right? Europe's currently falling behind. Patient access is at risk. As I mentioned, it's a little bit of a yellow warning light that is flashing. So our view is we should embrace, you know, some, some specific steps to deliver for patients going forward, right? And modernize health systems by implementing positive changes to both the pharmaceutical legislation and the European HTA. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting to see the historical development and the key role that the EU has played both in helping to define and name this category of medicine and products and to, as you say, lean into the science to truly uh, try to understand what is this new science and how do we respond to it? So now I'm delighted to pass the floor to Stelis Kimperopoulos, a member of the European Parliament from Greece, from the PPE political group, who is our host, and thank you for welcoming us, who will give us a formal welcome. Dear guests, dear speakers, dear colleagues, first of all, I would like to excuse me for this uh, change on the schedule, uh, but on, on the other hand, I would like to thank you all for being here today. I would also like to thank Alliance for Degenerative Medicine and everyone that helped make this event happen. I'm happy to see such a big participation. Really, I'm very, really very glad and I'm very optimistic that we are in a, a period of time that the health issues are in, on the front line. But especially for this event, I'm, I'm very glad that I'm hosting. It is very, it is very important for me. As you, you may know, I'm a rare disease person, a doctor, and also a politician. And I trust the science and uh, can value the importance of a treatment. There are many patients around uh, the world that need access to treatment or are lacking treatment options. However, science is advancing rapidly. And in order for it to advance even more, our society must catch up. We need to give our scientists the necessary tools and resources to boost research and development. We need to address the needs and deliver the future of medicine to all European patients as well as patients across the world. ATMAP's advanced therapy medicinal products are at the forefront of global scientific innovation in healthcare. These treatments, which include gene therapies, somatic cell therapies, and tissue engineered products, have the potential to transform patients' lives, lives providing new therapeutic options for diseases for which there are limited or no available treatments. And in some cases, they can be potentially curative. There are over 30 million patients in Europe with a rare disease. Less than 10% of them receive treatment and only 1% are managed using an approved treatment. Including myself also in this kind of treatment with multiple approved products and numerous more in the pipeline. This is a pivotal time to build a future proof innovation model for ATMPs. Despite the fact that you have approved the first ATMP and gene therapy ahead of the US, there is failing competitiveness with research and development in investment, clinical trials, clinical trials and manufacturing output all decreasing. Europe is losing ground to competitors in the US and China, as we heard before. In my particular ATMP clinical trial activity is twice as high in the US and almost three times as high in China compared to Europe. The number of clinical trials conducted in the US and Asia Pacific region grew by about 70% 
in the last decade, while Europe remained stagnant. Considering the long-term benefits to patients and society, we need Europe to become more attractive, attractive for developing HMPs to compete in the growing global market for advanced therapies. The implementation of the EU legislation on health technology assessment, ATA, the European Health Data Space, EHDS, and the forthcoming revision of the EU pharmaceutical legislation, if designed in the appropriate way, could offer an opportunity to bring the EU back on track with regards to its competitiveness in the ATMPs sector. A broader, holistic value assessment could enable timely patient access to ATMPs, while stronger collaboration between industry, the European Medicine Agency, and health HTA agencies is needed to harmonize evidence requirements and facilitate greater acceptance of gene therapies. To this end, it is of utmost importance to include patients and healthcare professionals to capture a holistic view of treatment value and fill the evidence, let's say, knowledge gaps. We need to understand that cell and gene therapy represent tremendous hope for patients with serious diseases in the EU. But if we do not act to ensure patients have access, hope is all we will have. I'm very glad again that I uh, host this event and uh, I'm here to hear, to hear, and also my staff to uh, continue hearing all of you and all of your different aspects. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stelios, and, and very much a champion and thought leader in the European Parliament. We welcome your openness and the offer to meet your team and share perspectives. We're now going to hear from Emily and Tom Whitehead. Now, Emily was the first paediatric patient to be cured with a CAR T cell therapy, and Tom is going to share some of her story, some, some of the pathway, and so we can understand the impact it had on their lives. So, Tom, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank the Alliance of Regenerative Medicine for including us today and, uh, and thank my daughter Emily for coming. Um, Emily was born uh, May 2nd, 2005, and she was perfectly healthy for the first five years of her life. Um, then after her fifth birthday, she had finished preschool, uh, was getting ready for kindergarten, and um, it was overnight that everything changed for us. We were going into Memorial Day weekend uh, back home. Uh, we live in Pennsylvania in the United States. And on a Thursday, she was healthy and overnight she had severe leg pains. Um, during that week, my wife had noticed that she, she kind of 21 bruises on her body. She had called me the night before and said, you know, I saw blood on Emily's gums twice this week when she was brushing her teeth and with all the bruises that aren't getting better, um, I think there's something wrong with her. It could be leukemia. And we tried to, you know, we just said, oh, it's not going to be leukemia. Let's take her to see the pediatrician tomorrow and we'll see what happens. But overnight, um, twice Emily woke us up and said, there's something wrong with my legs. And, and she was crying in pain by the next morning. Um, so Thursday, perfectly healthy. By Friday afternoon, we were at the uh, Penn State Hershey Children's Hospital on a morphine pump and told that she had acute lymphoblastic leukemia. We were told this is a garden variety kind of leukemia. Um, if you have to have a child with cancer, this is the one you want to have. It's 90% of the kids that do chemotherapy for girls, it would have been 26 months. If you just do what we tell you, she'll be fine. She'll grow up and become a grandmother someday. It was a tough start. Um, Emily got started and within two weeks and just two outpatient uh, treatments, uh, she ended up with infections in both legs and uh, we got started on May 28th of 2010 and, and on June 11th, we were taken into a room and saying, you know, Emily might lose both legs today. She has infections, fascia, uh, 
necrotizing, necrotizing fasciitis. fasciitis. Thank you. <laughs> and um, that was pretty rough, but she got through that. They saved her legs. Um, she was in the intensive care unit the rest of the first month. And um, at the end of the month, we were told she was in a remission. So we were very hopeful, even though she had a tough start, that it would go okay. Over the next 16 months, she remained in remission, um, but it wasn't usually the way they told us it was going to go. Uh, she had a lot more nausea sometimes. Other times they said or she'll lose her hair after this medicine and she still had her hair. So we just noticed that what they were telling us wasn't always uh, going the way they said. Um, so 16 months in, actually the day before she relapsed, uh, Emily announced uh, to, to my wife's aunt, she said, I think my cancer's grown again. Um, I took her for routine blood work the next day and our local pediatric oncologist said, Tom, it doesn't happen when, when chemotherapy works for these kids, it works. So she's still in treatment. And I said, all right, but she, she said she thinks it's growing again. So he took uh, her blood and the next day he called me and said, unfortunately, she's in a full relapse. Um, so what we did then, one of the best moves we made before we moved forward was we went for a second opinion at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And we, uh, the protocol at the time was to go to bone marrow transplant. And they said, we have this up and coming trial, but don't wait for it because it's not going to be ready for Emily. Um, and we're not allowed to give it yet. So that's when we first heard of CAR-T. Uh, we, we tried to go to bone marrow transplant and Emily's, uh, they identified a non-related donor because she's an only child. And um, they were shooting for the first week of February of 12 uh, to, to take her to bone marrow transplant. And they called us mid-January and said, unfortunately, your donor's not available to show up. So we have to put her on hold uh, to the end of February when the donor's able to come in. And then mid-February, she relapsed again, and they told us it was time to take her home and enjoy the days we had left with her. So we, uh, page chop one more time. Uh, these were pictures of Emily uh, from the beginning until October of 11 when she, uh, when she relapsed. Um, so now um, I actually paged a chop and said, I'm not ready to take her home, and I'm bringing her down, uh, putting her full care uh, with you in Philadelphia, um, no matter what. And they said, well, we find it amazing that you paged us today because we got the internal review board permission to try these CAR T cells yesterday. So we transferred down on March 1st of 12 uh, to the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And um, the left picture is uh, them doing the apheresis of Emily's T cells from her white blood cells. And they told, you know, kind of explained it to Emily that we're going to send your your cells off to the lab and, and train them to become an army that's going to recognize and fight your cancer when we put them back in you. Um, after uh, they did the apheresis, um, she had to stay in isolation in her, in her hospital room for six weeks uh, because they had to give her the harshest round of chemotherapy they had uh, ever given her to buy them the time to grow these T cells. So um, after uh, the clofarabine round of chemotherapy, um, it, wiped out her immune system so she was not able to fight any germs and they told us at that time you know if you bring the common cold into this room right now it's going to take her life so we were very thankful to make it to um, car t-cell day when they first infused her and that's a picture of dr stephen grupp on the right uh, on april 17th of 2012 is when she got her first dose of the car t-cells and they said you know there's no child in the world that's ever received this type of therapy um, we're going to um, give her 10% of the dose on day one and just see how it affects her body. Uh, we'll give her 30% on day two, and then the final 60% of everything goes right on day three. So day one, uh, she felt fine, and we actually left the hospital. And um, day two, they gave her 30%. She, she looked great, and uh, we went home. Or we went back to um, my wife's sister's house, who lived about 25 minutes away from Philadelphia, um, and she spiked the fever around midnight, so we went back to the ER because at that point we weren't like comfortable being away from the hospital. Um, they admitted her, but by morning she had no fever, and, and then they gave her her final 60% of her dose. And then things got really, um, it was probably the most stressful part of her treatment. Uh, we would find out later that she had three and a half pounds of her body weight, which she weighed at that time somewhere around 65 pounds. Three and a half pounds was cancer and every one of the modified T cells uh, can kill a thousand tumor cells. So uh, with her cytokine storm is what they called it, cytokine release syndrome, um, it completely overwhelmed her system. 
And um, within 24 hours of the final dose, they were taking us to the intensive care unit and they put her on an oscillating ventilator to breathe for her and put her in an induced coma. And she would stay in that coma for the next 14 days. And during that time, we actually had an evening when the head of the intensive care unit came in and said, uh, there's a one in a thousand chance that your daughter's alive when the sun comes up. And I asked him at that time, you know, keep helping us because she's going to change the world. So she made it through that night and the next day they come in and said, we were going to try a drug that's never been tried on a cancer patient before. It's for arthritis, but this storm that Emily's having, there's a protein in her system, interleukin-6, that's a thousand times higher than anybody that we've seen alive. And this medicine, which was approved three months ago by the FDA, shuts off interleukin-6. So they gave her tocilizumab the morning after she survived that night when they didn't think she could. And within hours, they were telling us, we've never seen a child this sick get better any faster. Everything turned around that, that saved her life. Um, and she woke up from the 14-day coma on her seventh birthday. I'm scroll down here. Um, so that was May 2nd of 2012 when she woke up. And eight days later, they tested her bone marrow. Uh, which was 23 days after her first infusion, and she was completely cancer-free. So uh, I brought this slide up just to show that we, even though she had the most curable kind of cancer, we did 22 months of, of her treatment, standard treatment, which failed her twice after initially getting her into remission. And then after trying the CAR T-cells, um, 23 days later, she was cancer-free and remains that way, and we're 10 and a half years past at this point. So... Um, after surviving all that, uh, it was very, you know, amazing for our family to take her home on June 1st of 2012. So, you know, we had those 22 months of failed treatment. We transferred down to Philadelphia on March 1st and June 1st, we took her home. Um, we had a quiet six months in our house where she was just healing up and she went back to second grade. She had actually kept up with her schooling during those two years of treatment and got through uh, kindergarten and first grade. So she went back to second grade with the, the kids that she was supposed to start kindergarten with. Um, and things got normal for about six months. And during that time, the doctors were going for peer review and they came back and said, okay, in December, the beginning of December, we're allowed to talk about it. So would you do an interview with the New York Times? Um, so we did, we did an interview and we made a short film that some of you might have seen online uh, it was called Fire with Fire. We were working with an Oscar-winning film director who just said, I have funding to make a, a short film about medical breakthroughs. So both were released on the same day in December of 2012. And that picture on the right is actually uh, the picture on the cover of the New York Times, which completely changed our lives again. Um, overnight, uh, you know, we didn't know what was coming when it, when you put her picture on the cover of the New York Times, but by the next morning, we had requests for interviews from all over the world. Um, it was completely overwhelming. Uh, we had the PR department at the hospital help us vet who we should talk to. Um, you know, there was a huge interest in, um, from everyone seeing that there, because HIV was used in the lab uh, to help train our cells, that there was a silver lining to HIV. Uh, being used to cure cancer. And um, I still joke with the photographer that took these pictures. We spent an entire day with him and he took over a thousand pictures of us and I was not in 10 of those pictures. And uh, one of the 10 I wasn't in is what ended up on the, uh, on the cover. So um, along with the international media interests, uh, we immediately got started getting calls from parents from all over the world, including Europe. I remember... Uh, I think the, the the first mother that reached out to me um, after Emily was getting better uh, was from Croatia, who said, "How can we how can we get this treatment? Um, we're being sent home on hospice." So ever since then, um, when Emily got better, we've been trying to pay it forward. Um, still today, I, I get calls from a couple parents a week. Ten years later, uh, from anywhere in the world, saying, um, "You know, we're we're in standard treatment. It's not working." and the oncology nurses come in and said, you better look up Emily Whitehead and, and, and her foundation. And 
and see if you can head in that direction. And even, even oncologists now are talking to the parents saying, you know, if you want to talk to somebody, reach out to the whiteheads. Um, so something amazing that's happened in our lives since then, you know, we try to focus on the positive. Uh, the first day Emily was diagnosed, I picked her up and said, only the strongest children are picked to fight cancer and you're going to be a hero because you're going to beat it no matter what. Um, but just to see the, the things that have changed since she got, since she got better, um, it's been incredible. Incredible things have happened in our lives, but everything we do has been to try to help other families uh, have the same outcome as us. Uh, when, when she came out of her coma, she had to learn to walk again. And I kept helping her get out of bed, and it was very painful. And um, I told her, I said, you know, you got to get out of bed because what you pioneered here is going to change the world, and someday you're going to meet the president. You know, so after a couple of days of saying that, my wife, Carrie, said, you know, stop saying that. It's not going to happen. So um, a couple of years after we got home, uh, I, was, I work on the power lines, and I'm the lineman that shows up when your house is out of power or if there's an electrical emergency with high-voltage lines. But I was working an evening shift, and I got a call from Secret Service saying uh, President Obama would like you to come to the White House, <laughs> and uh, they're going to announce that they have bipartisan support to fund precision medicine because this is a new way to fight cancer. Um, and I, you know, I said, does anybody say no? And they, they laughed, and I said, well, I, I told my daughter she's going to meet the president. So... When we come down, can you ask him to actually meet her? I don't want her to just be in a room that he walks through. And, and they said, Mr. Whitehead, we can't confirm or deny that the president will be in the room that day. And I said, I understand what you have to tell me, but um, please help a dad out. So um, they got back to me an hour later and said, if you go to the JFK painting uh, in the room that everyone's waiting in at this specific time, that the Secret Service will take you into another room where we will not confirm or deny who Emily might meet. Um, so we went in that room and Emily asked, uh, he said, what can I do for you for coming today? I really appreciate you coming. And she said, well, I need an excuse for school. So he wrote, please excuse Emily. Uh, she was with me. <laughs> so that's just, uh, you know, from the time she got better, I said, I would, I would like to be part of getting this approved uh, first by the FDA because all these other families need access to it. Um, and it was quite an honor for me uh, when the, ODAC hearing finally happened at the FDA. Uh, we took Emily to it. And I said then, and I'll, and I'll say today, that any words that come out of my mouth to share our story uh, don't mean as much as seeing what the cure looks like. And I got Emily to come along with me. It's not always easy for us to travel, but uh, I'm very proud to, to have her uh, by my side and, and still be her dad. And, you know, there's families in Europe right now that need these treatments uh, uh, to give them hope like we found. So everything we do is to try to make a difference and, and try to get uh, more access. I know of patients that have been treated in over 80 countries right now. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of things have changed in the 10 years since she got better. Um, I know if Emily went to bone marrow transplant, she wouldn't be 10 and a half years since she spent a night in the hospital. Uh, and in the United States, the cost is very comparable to a bone marrow transplant. Um, but back when Emily got it, it was a lot higher. Um, as a parent who lived through it, uh, I saw millions of dollars charged to my Blue Cross for her entire treatment, where, you know, once I lived through that, if I look at the price that is in the United States today, as somebody who experienced it, it's, it seems like a very a value, especially um, when I tell people that when you save a child, you save an entire family. So... May 10th is when Emily found out, when we found out that the treatment had worked. So each year on May 10th, we take a picture of Emily's uh, cancer-free date. And um, we've just had amazing things in our lives happen ever since then. And we travel around and, and share her story as much as possible to make a difference. Um, one of the families, uh, one of the mothers here today from a family uh, who found out about the treatment for her son, Opie, um, in London, uh, from hearing about Emily's story. And, and when they reached out, I, I told them what it's like. And, and we have a private Facebook group for the next families that go through, so parents don't have access to talk to parents who've already experienced, because we didn't have that, and we never wanted that again. And in that private Facebook group right now, there's over 400 families uh, that are there to help the next family answer questions um, for, what, uh, for what it's like when you actually experience the storm and just to help them get through it. Uh, on Emily's 10-year uh, cancer-free anniversary, they were finally ready to call it a new cure. 
and the fourth pillar to fighting cancer, where you had chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery in the past. Now there's training the immune system. Uh, we've seen uh, probably an uptick in adults that are now calling us. Um, probably a quarter of the calls I get are from adults looking for the same hope. And uh, each and every day, all we try to do, again, is help uh, more families get it. And we, we've helped many families. You know, in the beginning, I actually witnessed that a family from Europe had to rely on a celebrity to make a video to get funding so they could go to the United States to get treated. And um, there was one family that almost ran out of time. And then Simon Cowell uh, made a video saying, let's help this family get over to the United States and get Emily's treatment. And within five days, they raised a million dollars. But all I could think of is what about the families that can't raise that or don't get that option from and, and your child's life shouldn't depend on the next celebrity that's willing to try to help. So again, all we want to see is uh, this, these new treatments get approved and we're going to do everything in our power from the Emily Whitehead Foundation to try to help make these more globally accessible. And uh, this is a, a picture of our family. We held a gala in Philadelphia and brought a lot of the CAR-T families together um, and because we get to go to a lot of events, including in Hollywood. And Emily brought up one day, what about the other kids? We need to have a special event for them too. So. Um, we've been very proud that as a family, we've raised over $2 million to help the research move forward, but there's a lot more needed. And I would just like to say too that, you know, when Dr. June treated Emily, um, he was out of money. And now there's hundreds of millions of dollars in research coming in each year to keep it moving forward. And there's a whole workforce in Philadelphia that has brought in uh, billions of dollars into the economy there. And you have an entire trained workforce already ready to come back to Europe. Um, everywhere we go when these are being manufactured, there's people from Europe working in there that already know how to do these treatments. So we're really hoping that, that they get passed here and that the, the people in Europe have much more access to it. And we look forward to maybe holding a gala here someday with all the survivors uh, that are from here. Uh, but from our family and from all the families that need hope, I'd just like to say thank you. Thank you very much to Brian and to Emily for sharing your story and, and, and taking us through the realities of what it's like, what a family experiences from the, the, the terrible day of getting a diagnosis to the future and the hope that we could get from CAR-T. So thank you very much. I'd now like to introduce Sylvain Giraud, uh, the head of unit within DG Santé that has responsibility for the advanced therapy medicinal products. So we started with Tim setting out, you know, how much Europe has played a role in the past. Uh, the pipeline is coming, but we've got some concerns about the number of trials and other things. So, Sylvain, we're going to pass the floor to you to invite you to share your perspective from the European Commission. Sylvain. Yeah, thank you, Tamshin. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to be in meetings that you chair. And a pleasure to be here with all of you in the European Parliament and uh, to be invited to uh, express some views from the European Commission on the, the different important subjects that have already been, uh, um, that have already come out from uh, the different uh, the speakers in the different perspective that they brought to the issue. So um, what I would like to share with you is, is uh, five uh, messages or elements uh, of interest uh, from the point of view of the Commission. And uh, let me do that, referring you to the sort of holistic approach that uh, we have um, taken in a document that maybe uh, many of you are aware of, which is the pharmaceutical strategy for Europe that the Commission published at the end of 2020, and which in a way is our roadmap for uh, developing uh, medicines policy and legislation uh, in the years to come. Um, and the four or five elements I want to um, mention is, well, recall the importance of uh, the ATMP framework, legislative framework, uh, in this context, highlight uh, the specificities of uh, this product in particular in relation to the need to generate real world evidence and data in the regulatory decision making. Uh, the third point would be to refer to how important is academic research and the way it translates into development of ATMPs. The fourth one will be to talk about access and uh, come back to some of the issue of access beyond authorization. 
And finally, I'd like to highlight some of the issues in relation to the borders between legislation and in particular, the border line between what we call SOHO, the substances of human origin that are regulated in one uh, framework and the, um, and the, uh, and the, the, the pharmaceuticals that are regulated in a different framework, including ATMPs. So I try to do that as fast as possible. Uh, first, uh, uh, to tell you that we have a well-established framework, regulatory framework in the EU to deal with ATMP. Uh, it is a, a different, but of course, coordinated with the overall objectives of and logic and, and regulatory aspects of the uh, pharma legislation. So it's not so much as just another pill or like the old fashioned pill. I think there are a certain number of elements that are um, provided specifically for ATMPs and that some of their specificities are taken care of by the legislator of Bintang. And on the basis of that, this is, this is a, a regulation that was adopted in, in 2007 and started to be operational a few years after. And that since then, an, an important, a reasonable number, let's say, of uh, uh, um, products have been authorized in that context. 23 products uh, have been authorized. Um, uh, centrally approved as who the centrally approved mechanism that is uh, um, uh, run uh, uh, by the Commission. So the approval and the authorization is given by the Commission, but on the basis of uh, uh, an in-depth analysis um, assessment uh, in conducted by the European Medicines Agency uh, with the participation of the national competent authorities and national agencies as necessary. Uh, this is how it works. So it follows the same steps and the same approach and the same logic and the same requirement in terms of efficacy, safety, uh, risk benefit analysis that is conducted for uh, medicines uh, applied to this particular, to the particular area of therapies we're talking about. Um, this, uh, you've heard about the revision of the pharma legislation already. This is something the commission has indicated we, we, we are doing, we are planning to do, we are about to make proposals in the next few months. Uh, we have explained in the pharmaceutical strategy for Europe uh, what, uh, what is the direction of travel for these uh, changes? And I think uh, I can't tell you much more today because our proposals are being prepared and they, they will be very soon on the table of the Parliament and the Council. What I, what I can say is that we certainly want to encourage innovation through a system of um, incentives and obligations that would support uh, innovation, that would increase access, that would um, also address uh, issues relating to affordability of medicines and that we will also want to uh, uh, improve or adapt the regulatory framework to products such as ATMPs um, and to uh, ensure that scientific development can be taken up by the regulatory system as necessary. The second element uh, I wanted to refer to is um, uh, the specific situation of generating real world evidence as part of the of the um, of the ATMP approval and authorization mechanisms. And clearly, um, clearly, the complex nature of uh, ATMPs um, uh, shake and challenge some of the uh, way medicines uh, are approved, and uh, this is. Uh, um, one can say, as it was said, that the system is outdated, that it is old fashioned. Maybe that's a bit of an unfair criticism because the system has shown a certain agility to adapt and will continue to show agility as much as possible to adapt to uh, uh, the challenges that new types of products and, and therapies um, uh, constitute for, or create. Um, in this regard, the need for real-world data has become part of the picture for evidence generation and has been recognized as such um, by the regulatory authorities. And that initiatives have been taken um, to address these questions of availability of real-world evidence going beyond traditional clinical trials. Uh, and then um, ensuring that uh, quality, completeness, and comparability of uh, real-world evidence and real-world data is there. The EMA uh, and the national authorities uh, coordinated by the EMA um, have, have been working on that and are still working on that. And this has uh, led to the creation of a 
coordination center called uh, Darwin EU, the Data Analysis and Real World Interrogation Network. Uh, this is a, uh, this will become a, a way for DMA to generate um, support uh, uh, studies and evaluations uh, to support regulatory decision making. It will connect the different uh, regulatory network uh, to the uh, through also the European Health Data System that is going to be put in place, and that will be a, a significant development in the generation of uh, a real world evidence. The third point I wanted to make is in relation to how we can further ensure translation of academic research into ATMPs. Um, as it was mentioned earlier, there is something called the hospital exemption in the uh, in the legislation that allows uh, for uh, uh, non for hospitals to develop products uh, on a non routine basis in order to cover specific unmet medical needs. And um, this has played a very important role uh, in the clinical development of ATMPs in the last few years, and there have been a, a certain number of success stories that uh, are well documented. Uh, involving uh, public research institutions and academic hospitals. It has, a, it has been a way to deliver uh, innovation also at uh, an affordable price for health systems. Um, another element in relation to the translation of academic research into ATMPs um, is a new recent initiative that EMA has launched in October 2022, a pilot to support the the basic research developments into medicines that could make a difference for patients' lives. And the pilot is open to academic sponsors and non-profit organizations who are developing ATMPs. And during this pilot, EMA will provide the, um, the applicants uh, or the, 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 select, the, the, the groups or the groupings that are selected. Uh, they will provide regulatory support um, and they will uh, uh, help this uh, academic and non-profit developers through the procedure. The last or the fourth point, and I guess I need to go faster. Yeah, okay, well, I, I go very faster to talk about access because access obviously is not just about authorization or authorization does not necessarily determine access. You know that access to certain therapies across Europe is, depends. It's very much a decision of the national level. It's very much a decision that also relies to other elements than um, the safety, efficacy and risk benefit because of course there are other elements which are also very legitimate public policy objectives, um, which are effectiveness, cost effectiveness, are they, this is perceived by the health systems authority, by the payers, by the, uh, uh, from the point of view also of uh, value for money, from the point of view of the certainty of the potential benefits, from the point of view of the contribution of the product to the health system's needs. Um, and, and of course, also from the point of view of a public health policy generally and the budget that is allocated to it by national uh, member states. So this is very much a national policy. But as it was said before, uh, through the HTA uh, proposal that has now become a regulation, the Commission has tried to ensure a stronger coordination between national authorities in the way um, clinical in the way HDA are conducted and in the way they can support uh, decision making on pricing and reimbursement at national level. Another thing the Commission has been doing is to um, support and provide a framework for the national competent authorities of pricing and reimbursement so that they can discuss together a certain number of key um, challenges they face in relation to specific products such as ATMP, for example, or CAR T cells or specific products so that they can discuss also their best practices, how they deal with that and, and possibly develop common approaches uh, to uh, ultimately uh, provide more access. And then the final point I want to make is in relation to the borderline between legislative framework and in particular the borderline between uh, what is a pharmaceutical and what is a substance of human origin. Um, this is for me the occasion to draw your attention to a commission proposal that was made in July this year and that is currently on the table of the Council and the Parliament that is uh, proposed to further harmonize the requirements for quality, safety uh, of an oversight of the substances of human origin, so blood, tissues and cells and other substances. 
except organs that are regulated separately. Uh, this um, legislation uh, does not uh, uh, propose to change any of the borderline between what is a substance of human origin and what is a medicine. Um, the uh, substance of human origin framework applies to donation and collection of all products that are substances of human origin. Um, and also it applies to their further processing unless that further processing make them fall into the category of medicines according to the criteria that are set in the pharmaceutical legislation uh, for it to be a medicine. And um, we believe that, uh, so we're not touching the, the scope uh, from this point of view. And uh, with this, we believe we have a future-proof approach and that this will help clarify um, the situations of borderline uh, discussions that we've had. Some of the operators have asked for, uh, have said that there is a lack of clarity of, in the criteria in relation to terms like industrial processing, substantial manipulation, etc. Um, and then um, we uh, think that uh, with the proposal we're making and also the forthcoming proposals that will come uh, to revise the formal legislation, we will be able to put in place a good cross-border coordination that will address possible further issues in relation to borderline and that will uh, be able to um, uh, catch issues of um, uh, potential uh, inconsistencies across um, across the member states on this point. So those were, uh, Tamsin, thank you, the five points I wanted to make. And of course, uh, I'm available also for questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sylvain, for giving us some of the perspective and also helping to understand, you know, how these two different regulatory frameworks are compatible and complementary. Because as you say, there's a new proposal out for SOHO substances of human origin, which would cover, you know, blood and tissues and cells. And yet CAR-T is something different because we're talking about cells that are then extracted in and processed so that they become a medicine. So you're not suggesting any change, but you see a connection between those two regulatory frameworks, which will hopefully be the passage forward. And again, thank you for highlighting things like the Darwin uh, platform, which will be looking at how to integrate real world evidence, because you know we heard Emily's story, it's an ongoing story. So collection of data over time is, is critical for this area, so thank you very much. We are running short of time, so I'm going to propose that we move straight to the next panel. But on the behalf of our audience here and those watching online, I want to say a warm thank you to Sylvain, to Tim, to Brian and Emily for joining us today, and thank you very much. Now, while I ask my next panel to come up and join me, we're going to ask you a question via Slido. And we've heard a whole range of different perspectives. And what we want to do is to get a sense of how you feel. So the question we're asking you on Slido, so you need to go to slido.com and you need to put in the code ARM22. The question we're asking you is, how do you feel about the future of ATMPs in Europe? And you, you have a choice. It's a five-point scale. And that ranges from not at all optimistic, not optimistic, neutral, optimistic, or very optimistic. So we heard a range of different perspectives from our earlier speakers. And having listened to that, we want to know currently where you feel about the future of ATMPs in Europe. So we're inviting you to make a choice amongst those options, ranging from the very optimistic to not at all optimistic. We want to see where you are in that framework. So thank you. I can see that some people are already voting and in a moment we should be able to see the results of that on screen. But we want to get a sense, having heard those interventions, where do you fit on the optimism, pessimism scale about the future of ATMPs in Europe? Are we able to see the results of the voting on the, on the screen, please? Ah, okay, here we go. So what I can see is that about a third of you are not optimistic and a third are optimistic. So you're quite evenly spread. Um, but uh, 
not optimistic is so far 35 percent another 18 percent not at all optimistic so for me i feel like that um perhaps that we are erring towards the not so optimistic area and that's i think what we're going to try and discuss in this panel how do we uh, address that and how do we improve patient access to the advanced therapies medicinal products in europe so I'm joined by a fantastic panel, and I'm really pleased to welcome them all. So let me just introduce you so you can see who's around me, and then I've got specific questions to each of them. So joining me, I have Patrick Chellis, the Scientific Administrator for the Committee for Advanced Therapies from the European Medicines Agency. Lucy Elika, who's a patient advocate and will be sharing the story of her son, Opi. I have Simone Bozelli, the Director for Public Affairs for the Eurodis Rare Disease Europe Network of Patients. Susanna Solis Perez, a member of the European Parliament with a specific interest in this, and Chris Van, the Chief Operating Officer at Autolus, and a member of the Alliance for the Regenerative Medicines Board. So this is who I have on my panel here to help us explore this. And the focus of this panel is how do we improve patient access to ATMPs in Europe? Now, in, uh, Sylvain said and other people said that authorization entry to the market does not equal automatically access. So there are other elements that we need to explore in this and help us understand that our panel will have various different insights to share. But I'm going to start with Lucy, um, because I think it's always useful to hear the patient perspective first. We heard from Emily and Tom about their journey and their fight against leukemia um, in, for their daughter. Lucy, your son, Opie, was diagnosed with leukemia at the age of just five months. Can you share your story with us and give us a perspective of why it's so important that patients could have access to these kinds of advanced therapies without delay? Yeah, um, thank you. Sorry, thank you. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, Opie was only five months old when he was diagnosed with infant leukemia, which is very aggressive. We were told within a few days <clears throat> that the options were bone marrow transplant and if he relapsed uh, there was another kind of therapy that had just been approved um, but that was only if he relapsed and that was CAR-T. Um, he went on to have multiple rounds of chemotherapy um, which was very traumatic um, to go through with your baby. Um, we were in isolation in hospital. We went home for 20 days on an immunotherapy. That's because the chemotherapy hadn't quite worked. So they tried the immunotherapy, which wiped his leukemia out really well and got him home for the whole 20 days, which was amazing. Um, and then we were back in hospital um, for more rounds of chemotherapy ahead of his stem cell transplant. He had a, a donor cells from America so in total, it was uh, five months from October to March before he had his stem cell transplant. He was doing really, really well um, after that. And then um, our world was devastated again when he relapsed um, just after one years old. Um, we were told then that he was now eligible for CAR-T therapy. Hurrah. Um, and that was a very different experience from start to finish. Uh, he only needed a small amount of uh, chemotherapy to get him ready to have his CAR T cells. Um, so although his disease rapidly increased from when they, they found out he relapsed, uh, he had in another immunotherapy which reduced his, his leukemia from 93% back to 1%. Um, he only needed a small, light amount of chemotherapy for lymphodepletion to make a bit of room for the CAR T cells. Um, and he had experienced CRS within four, day, four, four days after he'd had his CAR T cells. Um, he was in ICU for 24 hours, and the medicine that Tom White had talked about Emily having... Um, was given to him as soon as his CRS was present and within 24 hours he was back to a happy little baby again. Um, because he didn't need to have as much chemotherapy um, and the toxicity was so, so was much less, um, we were able to take him home um, within, well, it was three weeks from start to finish, which was obviously a lot quicker than, than stem cell transplant. 
Um, and his, he didn't lose all of his hair. He didn't get um, mucositis. He, he, was, he was poorly. Of course he was poorly, but it was not not as toxic and traumatic as stem cell transplant. Um, and he should have had that first. Um, that's what I we firmly believe as a family that uh, it should be the first line of treatment, not the last. Um, Opie now is a very happy little two-year-old <laughs> um, getting into lots of mischief, but we don't know what, what the, the future is in terms of the toxicity because of the amounts of chemotherapy he had at such a crucial age in his development when he was less than a year old. Um, there he is. So up there. So the fir one, first slide is, you can see, four weeks after stem cell transplant, he lost all his hair. He had to be on um, total nutrition through his feeding tube for a week. Um, but he'll smile throughout everything because, you know, he's just OP. But um, whereas the other slide, 10 days after CAR-T, his hair didn't fall out. He was only on uh, the nutrition through a tube for, for 24 hours. Um, the, the difference was, was re remarkable really remarkable. <laughs> there is another slide of him now. There he is now. So yeah, that's in one year cancer free. Uh, yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And, and again, highlighting that, you know, CAR-T came at the end of a journey and just how much impact that journey had on his health and well-being. And so at the point at which that the, the advanced medical um Therapy was available. You know, he's already been through an awful lot, and it's it's that long term toxicity toxicity that's the concern. So, thank you very much. I'd like to now turn to Patrick to take stock of how far we've come uh, since the application of the EU ATMP regulation and the approval of the first gene therapy by the EMA back in two thousand and nine. And we heard that you know the, e the EMA was a forerunner on this. That this was a, a an area where Europe was really in advance. From the perspective of the EMA, what can we learn from the last fifteen years or so? Um, how many of these advanced therapies have reached patients in Europe? Because we heard twenty three were approved, some have been removed. So. What's going on? What, you know, which were the clinical areas that we've really made progress in? And what are the lessons that we can learn in all the investment we heard that EMA made in the beginning in leaning into the science, understanding it? Um, why is it so important that we have a very robust regulatory approach to these therapies? Okay, many thanks for the questions. It's quite a lot you're asking, so let's try to reduce uh, uh, my input to what I consider as, uh, as a bit relevant for this discussion. It's super nice to hear from the parents of the patients being treated with products that we have seen in paper, in files, and that then you hear that this really makes a cha uh, change, so that is, of course, why we do it. Now, you heard about the numbers approved, 23, uh, most in the fields of um, oncology, that's the, all the CAR-Ts, uh, but also um, in, uh, in, in treatment of rare and very rare diseases, that's the gene therapies, either genetically modified cells or uh, the, the AV-based uh, uh, products. Now, 23, it doesn't sound a lot, and perhaps it isn't, but these are also very special products. And this number is more or less par to what U.S. has. It's not that we're lagging behind in any way. Be it the risk, like said, is that the environment seems to be a bit more difficult here in Europe uh, compared to other parts of the world. But uh, we live on hope. Changes to the pharma legislation are coming. Uh, HDA uh, uh, regulation is uh, there and will become uh, applicable. Now, the importance of having a um, robust regulatory system, which I consider is there, mm -hmm. is also that for the developers, there's a clear path forward. So they know what are the expectations and they know the, uh, what to do next mm -hmm. and what we expect to get the product approved. Uh, pipeline is certainly there, so that's a good thing. An additional point I want to make is that this regulatory framework that was established uh, in 2007 also made the possibility for all the EU member states to gain expertise. And that's 
quite often the input and uh, attendance to the meetings of the Committee for Advanced Therapy, so that right now, all over Europe, clinical trials can be done uh, with uh, advanced therapy products. The regulatory authorities approving the clinical trials know what to expect, know what to ask. Now, the second part of your question is, how many reached the patients? And that is a bit more of a tricky question. Uh, we have uh, data on um, how many ATMPs are marketed and the number of the, the, the uh, member states where they're marketed depends more on how long a product has been authorized rather than uh, the type of product. But that doesn't say anything, of course, with regards to reimbursement and, uh, and, and, and uh, HTA assessment, because there, there is still room for improvement. And like I said, I am looking forward to a full implementation of the HTA regulation and the joint clinical assessment, so that at least the reimbursement process, which is to be taken forward by the developers at uh, national level becomes also a bit more smoothly uh, over the future. And perhaps I stop here. Thank you very much. Let me now turn to, to you, Chris, because you are um, the CEO of a global company that's headquartered in Europe, and you're currently developing a CAR-T product, which is similar to the product CAR-T that um, saved uh, Emily and has done so well for Opie. So, um, you know, you, you're, you're developing it. When do you expect to be ready to apply for the authorization? And what are the challenges you see in trying to bring something like this to market in, in Europe? So uh, the company I work for, Autolysis, is, is based in Europe, European research, European manufacturing. Um, we have currently one product, which is in late stage development. We hope to file an MAA next year and actually commercialize it the following years for the adult form of the disease that was mentioned here, and, and, and clearly we need new treatment options for a range of range of patients. I came from big pharma, and, and certainly when you come into ATMPs, everything about them is innovative, the way they're manufactured, the distribution channels, the way in which you even conduct clinical studies. So, you know, one of the things I, I have to say that I find uh, very reassuring is, is when uh, legislation has the ability, for example, to remove a hurdle. So one thing that was Re uh, mentioned earlier was that the uh, uh, GMO uh, regulations are being addressed and certainly for, uh, for companies like us I can confirm that this has been a hurdle not just for phase one but also for phase two research in Europe. I think the second thing that we appreciate is very different is obviously the health technology assessment for a variety of reasons, uh, single use of product. Typically, you go to market with accelerated timelines and, and data sets. So that will require, obviously, a different approach. So I'm very supportive of addressing that through the joint clinical assessment, but only if the aim is actually to speed up and increase the market access for patients, because that should be the primary objective for everyone in this room. If I look at a couple of maybe unintended consequences, I think that there are two that really stick out. And the first is hospital exemption, where we may have a different view. And, and I'm fully behind using hospital exemption for compassionate use. We should all want the patients to receive the medicines as soon as possible. Companies like ours do come from academic research. It's really, it's really fuel for companies like ours to be formed. But I think there is a, there is a danger in actually uh, locking ourselves into what's essentially local supply of, of in inverted commas, affordable medicines. And I give you two dangers apart from the regulatory one of potentially having two different standards. The first one is, is that, you know, we're still very much at the start of CAR-T. We're still very much at the start of cell and gene therapy. We're making advances all the, all the time. So one of the risks we have is, is that if people get locked into older technologies, they're going to be less uh, willing to actually adopt the newer products as they come along with greater, um, uh, you know, preferred outcomes for things like the, you know, uh, more durable uh, response, more patients receiving cure. But I'm also not 100% certain that they're always going to be the most cost effective uh, products either. What we saw, for example, from Emily's case, and unfortunately we were, we were improving all of the time with CRS, that used to be a major problem that would put patients into 
uh, ICU for a number of days. You know, clearly the newer treatments are going to come along. They may appear uh, more expensive if you actually compare the fully loaded cost versus part of the cost, which which is actually you know the 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 kit to make the product as opposed to fully loaded cost inside the hospital. But they may also not still be cost effective because you may actually, for example, end up with products which take patients more into the ICU. So I think we've got to be very careful when we look to solve those types of uh, economic uh, uh, challenges through legislation that doesn't address the methodology and, and, if you like, encourages a distortion of the market potentially. And I think one other area we need to be a little bit careful is um, not myself, but a number of the companies that in, in ARM are actually dealing with uh, rare diseases, ultra-rare diseases, and it's desirable to have the patients treated as close as possible to home, but it may not make sense in every case, especially if there's only a handful of patients in Europe. We may have to look for a different solution, which is actually to get the patients to the centers of excellence rather than try to lock ourselves into to a center in every country, which is both duplicative in, 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 in uh, resources, but may also mean that the centers are not as experienced in that disease type. So I think that there's a lot of optimism. I think, you know, we have, it was mentioned already, we have the research, we have the medical expertise, we've got manufacturing expertise. A lot of my colleagues, by the way, I have a few Americans, but I also have a lot of Europeans. You know, this is a global business. People will actually go to where they believe there's an opportunity to bring real change for patients. So I believe that the Europe could be and the EU could be well placed to actually be leaders in the field, but it will require careful legislation and a, a very thoughtful approach to solving the problems that are inherent to ATMPs. Thank you very much, Chris, and we wish you the best of luck with the late stage uh, testing and the, the regulatory process. Um, Simone, let me turn to you because we heard Chris talk a little bit about the pathway to get there. And he, he mentioned something that I think you could pick up and talk about, which is hospital exemption. Can you explain to us what that is and, and how we should feel about it? What, what does your audit have to say on this? Uh, thank you very much, Thompson. First and foremost, I would like to thank Tom, Emily, Lucy, and Opie for, for sharing their story of bravery and trust in medical science. Uh, it is not easy to come up on a stage and talk about a personal experience in this way. But if we can manage to do so to advance um, uh, science the way it is advancing these days, um, we will make um, a lot of uh, people and relatives of people with, living with a rare disease much happier than they are today. When, it talk, when we talk about the 2007 ATMP of regulation and its inclusion of the hospital exemption, we have some colleagues in the room that have, were present actually and helped uh, structuring this um, uh, regulation. The hospital exemption was felt to be introduced as necessary to, to, to be included to, cu to cater for those um, uh, innovations that wouldn't have otherwise uh, be uh, sought after commercially because of the small population, because the very um, specific nature of the diseases. And definitely, I think, is still necessary as the commercially driven development might not be able to, cut, to cater for the over 6,000 rare diseases that are actually present, and particularly the 85 to 90 percent of these diseases that are, have a prevalence of at least less than 100,000. <laughs> so that's for sure needs to take, to take into place also to advance uh, university and academic research. And clearly it requires harmonization in the way that is implemented across, uh, across countries because um, in that sense we could have different standards being applied in different countries. And that's from a European perspective, um, it shouldn't, sh shouldn't be uh, allowed but uh, or shouldn't be possible. Um, and to ensure its proper use and guaranteeing a level playing field. Um, and uh, thirdly, uh, I think that um, we need to make sure that the safety uh, through the harmonized data collection of those th therapies across Europe is uh, necessary. And therefore, I really, um, I really uh, appreciate the way that the European Medicine Agency has launched the pilot to support also the academic research and the SME to go through the regulatory, uh, the regulatory process to make sure that those therapies those therapies are safe and available um, to in every country. But if I may say, um, Tamsin, um, I think in, in, in any case, the hospital exemption might be our uh, smallest of problems. I think we have uh, much more important 
issues to uh, to address, in particularly the single process to for a company like yours to arrive and deliver ATMPs to every patient that could need it in Europe. And now we are not in a situation like 2017, for example, where the, before the European Reference Network were put in place, we have now a clinical infrastructure that could allow for the sharing of the center of excellences. Plus, and already in 2018, Jan Lecam, my boss, has stated in this, uh, in this house, the four A's of ATMPs or the four challenges, Assess authorization, availability, assessment, and affordability. So this is things that we need to really tackle together. And I think we have all of the instruments in Europe to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Susanna, let me turn to you as a, a member of the European Parliament, you know, where some of these legislative proposals will come and be dealt with. Let's particularly touch on the general pharmaceutical legislation, which as we heard is, is likely to be up for, for review. What is your vision about how that could be used to improve Europe's competitiveness in this area of the ATMP? So thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to, to this event because it is important as co-legislators that we hear from you, from the experts, when this important legislation comes to the, to the parliament. And thank you for sharing your stories. It's so important that we hear from, from you what, what it means and something that is clear for me is that status quo, as Tim said, is not an option when millions of patients uh, depend on, on ATMPs. So uh, thank you for inviting the parliament and thank you uh, for, for, for learning from, from you. Um, as you said, this new legislation is a window of opportunity um, to reverse this um, declining competitiveness in, in Europe. I don't want to repeat what you have already said, uh, but um, we have or we should have an holistic approach, a holistic approach, putting the patient on the center. Um, we need to, as you mentioned, make regulatory process uh, easier. And, and we have to be sure that innovation happens in Europe because where innovation happens is important and where clinical trials happen is important. So we, we need to make EU attractive for clinical trials. And in this case, we need to work on harmonization. As, as you mentioned, I don't want to repeat what you have uh, already said. Why? Because it is important for the access, for patient access to have a clinical trials and to, to have fa faster access to them. Um, another challenge is, as you mentioned, uh, uh, approval timelines for new therapies. And to accelerate this process, we have to make sure we have the enough resources and capacities no? when we legislate. Um, and of course, reimbursement models, uh, it is another important topic. This is an issue that remained uh, on national competences, but we need to be innovative here and to share best practices among member states. And yes, when we talk about ATMPs, we need to talk about staggered payments or outcome-based uh, uh, reimbursement models. Um, something important for, for, for me is the role of SMEs because um, as you mentioned before, Europe has uh, the best ingredients to, to be a leader in innovation. Uh, we have a strong industrial base, startups, uh, research facilities, uh, outstanding universities, and a large number of small and mid-sized uh, biotech uh, businesses. And they play an important role uh, in, in, in the ATMP's development. And that's why in this regulation, we need to be ambitious, uh, but we have also to regulate with responsibility. And you know that the big discussion in the parliament will be uh, this launch conditionality. We have to take into account how it will affect uh, these SMEs, also with the unmet needs uh, definition. So I think we need that, that type of events. We need to hear from all the stakeholders, and we, think we need an open dialogue to find this balance between innovation and assure access, uh, patient access to ATMPs. So it's not an easy task. It will be hard, but it depends. Our uh, our future depends on how well we, we regulate and we, we legislate. Sorry. 
Thank you very much. We're now going to move on to discussing the new EU regulation on health technology assessment, which comes into force in January 2025. And this is going to be a, a new, introduces the joint clinical assessment, which in theory should make it easier for companies to introduce their, their products and to get a regulatory assessment. But now we'd like to find out, let's start with you, Chris, you know, is this good news, the joint clinical assessment? Do you think this will make a difference? Is it going to present new challenges or opportunities for you? So um, I think overall, and, and this is actually also the position of ARM, I think it's a very positive development because it's something that I think we all appreciate that we need to address the four A's. I think it's certainly going to be really helpful to have a degree of harmonization. It's also going to be really important to pool expertise because this is a, these are difficult challenges we face to actually make the products uh, accessible. And, and I do think that it's also really critical and core to the process that all of the stakeholders are actually engaged and work in a collaborative way. I think that you know the, the converse side, and where I've heard people both in America as well as Europe actually express their concerns, is that this could end up, and this is what we must avoid, being just an additional hurdle which causes an administrative delay, but doesn't necessarily achieve the ultimate objective, which is uh, finding a way to get the, the products to more patients faster and uh, uh, broadening access. So overall, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic, but I, I think we've still got to go a little way down the, the route of actually defining the details of how it's going to operate. Thank you. Simona, if I could ask you a similar question. I know that your colleagues within your orders have been, have been tracking this piece of legislation very closely. What's your perspective on the joint clinical assessment? Indeed, we have been tracking it because it, make, uh, it will make a huge difference on a number of, uh, of uh, um, uh, challenges in uh, accessing uh, treatment across Europe, particularly the, difference that can, the, the differences in assessment and appraisal that can be uh, difficult, to, difficult to be explained to our patients. They say, well, well, our, our neighbors do have it. Why don't we have it? I mean, that's really clear. And it, it becomes even more important for cell gene therapies, but even other ATMPs to have such a European approach. One, because I believe the science is pretty similar across Europe on a specific, uh, on a specific, uh, therapy, but also because of the number of patients that will be um, that, that could be potentially rich, which is very small, potentially under 500 uh, patients uh, per year uh, in, in, in Europe. Uh, this said, uh, currently the ways that the methodologies on HTA have been discussed, particularly for uh, ATMPs, I do not think uh, fully capture all of the uh, potential uh, benefits that those ATMP, uh, the ATMPs um, can provide. However, I do believe that the structured, if quite mandatory early dialogue between between developers, be, uh, sponsors, regulators, HD assessor, uh, patients and clinician should be included in the forthcoming legislation as part of a, what we call an orphan drug development plan, whereby the, uh, the, the key problem uh, in ATMPs the risk associated with uncertainties on long-term outcomes, on safety, et cetera, et cetera, can be addressed early enough to allow the sponsor to provide those evidence in ratio, be them with clinical trials, be them with real-world evidence, in a way that can be uh, addressed uh, as soon as possible, thus guaranteeing a more rapid access to therapies for patients. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simona. And we're sort of moving at a great pace through this last part of the panel because we've got eight minutes left and I, there's another meeting in this room at five o'clock. So we will have to vacate very promptly. So just two minute answers because I have two more questions I'd like to ask. Susanna, let's pick up on this issue of real world evidence because th this is critical to understanding the impact of ATMPs and how we can look at the issues like uncertainties over long term data. They're brand new. We don't know enough about them. So we've also got at the same time the new European health data space. So how do you see the link between this new health data space and the ability to generate the real world evidence that we need to understand how we can get greater access to ATMPs? Yeah. Thank you. You have explained it very well. Uh, we will have the coming. Uh, we are now negotiating the European Health Data Space in the Parliament, and we need to tackle the issue of, of how to use real-world evidence. Um, it is unexploited right now, and we need it for ATMPs, as you mentioned. So we need harmonised expectations. We need to have 
EU guidelines uh, uh, for, for the use of real world evidence. And I hope uh, this is the huge potential of the European health data space, not only the primary use of data, but also the secondary use of data. And I want to make sure that we will tackle this and we will end up with harmonized uh, rules or guidelines for, for Europe, being very briefly in order to have time for the rest of the speakers. Thank you very much, Susanna. Patrick, let me come to you because when we're talking about the fact that there is the, the recent proposal for SOHO, the substances of human origin, and we've got the pharma review of the legislation coming up, so both of them potentially could change the environment for this. Um, and there is a possibility that there will be a sort of form of deregulation in the, in the sense that we might get an expansion of the hospital exemption. Can you tell us a little bit more what the impact of this might be, either on the commercialization of experimental products or on your work or for patients? It's a broad question again. So uh, um, I think everyone understands ETMPs are very expensive products potentially have a huge impact on the uh, national health budgets. However, deregulation is what I feel not the appropriate way of uh, getting a, a higher access of these products to, to patients. It's not easy products to manage, to manufacture, but also to, uh, it's, there's a lot of safety issues, like said, um, needing specialized centers to use those products and a, regulate, a well regulated framework can take part, can take uh, stock of these uh, uh, difficulties with the products, also the uncertainties of the products, even at the time uh, of approval. So I think hospital exemption has a value, but should not be a, a replacement of the uh, uh, structured framework. Uh, otherwise, deregulation could end up with Europe coming, becoming even less attractive. Because then you will have more the Me Too products being developed and used under hospital exemption or a de deregulated version. And the global development by uh, uh, pharma industry might not see Europe as becoming an interesting uh, area to put a product on the market. So I think we need to have the balance right. And one of the initiatives that was also mentioned here is the uh, incentives that we are trying to, uh, uh, to put out for academic and non-profit developers, but also for SME developers to move ATMPs further into the development stage, hopefully to approve products. And we think working together with all the sectors, industry very important, but also the early developers in academia and the small and medium-sized enterprises together with the regulators is the way forward of getting products to the patients in an affordable manner. Never cheap, but certainly affordable manner. Thank you very much. Um, I think I'm going to be drawing our panel to a conclusion. There's a couple of points I just wanted to make. The first is there is an opportunity now for Europe to position itself and regain the, uh, the advanced position it had uh, on the ATMP. As, as we heard, Europe was at the beginning of the definition of this new category. We've got a very rich research base that we need to build up on. So I want to thank all of our speakers and highlight that the, um, the ARM, which is the organization that brought you today's event, is launching a call for action. They've produced a background note which explains what these ATMPRs are, how they're managed right now, all of the different legislative frameworks that are coming up at EU level with suggestions on how to make sure that we improve competitiveness as well as making Europe an attractive place to research and develop all of these products. But I don't want to close this panel without leaving the final word to the patients. We began with the story of Brian and Emily, and I'm going to ask Lucy to just share. You're, you're here in the European Parliament. I know it's not something you get a chance to do often, but if you are here and if you had a message that you'd like to give legislators, what would you like to say to them? Um, the, sorry, the, the treatments like CAR T therapy should be the first line of treatment. And without it, um, Opie would not be here. There's no doubt about it. He would have died. Um, we were on the path to, to palliative care with him. That, that's what was being d discussed. Um, and it, it should have been his, his first 
first treatment, not, not the last. Um, and more children and patients' lives will be saved if these treatments are available um, first for definite. Thank you. Thank you very much to Susanna and to other members of the panel of sharing your stories and for inspiring us to try to understand this new category and see what we can do to ensure that more patients, more children, more families can get a good outcome for this. So thank you to the panel members. Thank you for you who've joined us online and participated and those of you who've been here in the room. I'd like to now pass to, if I can invite the panel to move because I have to pass the floor to our last speaker. Dr. Miguel Forte for the concluding remarks. You are the president-elect of the International Society for Cell and Gene Therapy and, of course, a member of the board of ARM. Thank you. You, you, can, you can now choose any chair. You I can now choose any chair. I couldn't come through that way. But. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the excellent panel. I'll be brief, but hopefully impactful. ATMP represents an enormous value. We've seen that, fantastic science, value for patients, industrial and society value. It's a real opportunity to address unmet medical need and to have fun and enjoy bringing that to patients. Europe has played a major role on that. As a European, as a drug developer, as a former assessor, I'm stressed to see the stagnation in Europe. We saw the data there. We have a duty for our patients, a duty for our science to do better than that. We together have to harness the potential of ATMB products for patients. Patient access is critical. After all, that's why we do it. And we've heard here the message today. It's important that we do an assessment that is adequate to the products themselves and to the payers that we understand the value and do not create situations where understandable strategic options lead companies to remove products from the market because they're not able to get them access to patients. It's, it was said today, science is not different across the Atlantic. Patients are not different across the Atlantic. Access should not be different across the Atlantic. Clinical trial competitiveness is critical in Europe. And uh, we've discussed here about several things. I think the GMO legislation is a low hanging fruit and we shouldn't even be talking about it. We just be should be doing about it. And um, the hospital exemption was a, a lot of discussion as well. I am very pleased to see the European agency, where I was a member of before, bringing with an initiative to make sure that we have a single regulatory path in Europe for products that are commercialized. That ensures the access. It doesn't mean that we should remove hospital exemption. We should use it adequately as it was intended in the beginning for exceptional circumstances. We heard a lot of things here today. Um, about Europe, above all about the experiences. I learned something else today, that CAR-T in addition to CRS has got another side effect. You may end up meeting the president. <laughs> but the f it's a fantastic value and you've seen it. And you've seen one thing that struck me, it's a parent, I mean, a lot of you are parents, I'm a parent, a parent journey from despair to hope to cure. ATMP can do that. So we're at the generational moment to be able to impact the legislation, to do it well for innovation, do it well for industry, do it well for the patients after all. And I was very, very pleased to see that the legislation are aware of this. So, Thank you very much for the panel. Thank you for all of you being there. And I think thank you all for the fun and the value that we bring to patients. Thank you.
Thank you. If I could invite you to vacate the room swiftly, because the European Parliament's a bit of a conveyor belt. The next meeting is waiting to come in. Thank you.